The automotive industry is set for a revolution that will disrupt and reshape global business, threatening the survival of every organization. To make sure you survive and win in the new automotive game, automotive growth expert Roberto Dal Corso has interviewed global experts from the automotive industry to identify the changes and the impacts that are coming to keep you ahead of the curve. Good morning and welcome to the leading disruptive automotive trend summit from around the world. This morning we have a very special guest, Patrick O'Leary, old friend, I've known him for many years, all the way from Johannesburg, South Africa. Now, Patrick is the publisher and managing editor of South Africa's leading truck magazine, Fleetwatch. Patrick, welcome. Hi, uh, Robbie. Thanks so much, man. It's so wonderful talking to you across the uh, ether over all these miles. <laughs> um, and in the we used to have to uh, put through a trunk call. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. I mean, technology has come a long way. But, I mean, it's a Sunday morning, so thank you so much for taking time out of your extremely busy schedule. I mean, I know this has been fun to plan, but it's great to have you. I am so excited to do this with you today. Yeah, Ravi, it's an absolute pleasure, but I love your consistency. And I do apologize for the time that it's taken to get together. And so Sunday morning is an absolute pleasure to be with you. Any morning is a pleasure to be with you. Hey, Patrick. Just to get things started slowly, I mean, I've known you for, well, probably well over 20 years, and you've always been with Fleetwatch. Tell us a little bit about how Fleetwatch came about, how you got involved into all of the automotive industry, and what it is that you do, and, and tell us a little bit about what it is that you do in South Africa. Okay, well, the, um, the trucking industry actually put me online, you know, when I left school, I joined the army. I went to parachute battalions, specialist forces. Um, after that, I didn't know what on earth I wanted to do. So I sold insurance for about a month until I ran out of relatives. And I went to my father's factory as an electrician. And um, that was fascinating. I loved, I loved the trade, actually. It, it was really good, but I, I couldn't make it my life. And I wandered around. I drove trucks in the then Rhodesia. Um, I was a blood technician even. I went to the blood technician's uh, place there, worked night shift. And um, yeah, that was a bit boring, so I left there. And I didn't, I didn't have a clue. And then I had a very good friend by the name of Kerry Swift. And Kerry was one of the first journalists to, or one of the first students on the Rhodes Journalism uh, uh, or Department of Journalism course many years back, 1974, I think, and 75. And I, he used to, in his holidays, work on the Sunday Times, which is our, our mm. weekly newspaper, still going today. And I used to go pick him up at about one o'clock in the morning when they put the paper to bed. That was a Sunday morning. And then we'd hit the party. <laughs> and he, he was like the academic, and I was a bit of a lost Roma, you know. And anyone said to me, Pat, you taught me how to drink, I taught you how to think. <laughs> but when I used to walk into that Sunday Times newsroom late at night, while wow, the buzz was so amazing. There was no, not the small click of computers, talent keyboards. It was shouting and screaming and phones going and deadlines and typewriters clicking away. And I thought, wow, this is the vibe I want to be in, you know? And so I love people interacting. So, so I phoned a local newspaper and I said, I want to be a journalist. And they said, what experience you got? I said, well, I drove trucks. I was a blood technician. I told him, I've got none. I want to be one. She said, come and see me. And I started on the West End Times, one of the local newspapers, which was a great training ground for me. I met a wonderful man by the name of John Marsh, who got me into photography, and I just loved it. I loved it from day one. Then a friend of mine said, listen, they're looking at Thompson Publications, which we buy in that stage, an international publishing house of repute. I, I, I'm not sure what Thompson is now. They had Thompson's Travel, they had everything, but they had about 40 magazines. They're looking for an assistant on a magazine for commercial transport. So I went in there and I actually went my way. You know, um, the, the, the publisher said, what do you think about all this white space? And I looked at his face and I could see he didn't like it. So I said, no, there's too much white space. I don't know what you're talking about, white space, gaddies, I didn't have a bloody clue. But anyway, I got the job. And a great friend of mine, who turned in a great friend of mine, Justin Haler was editor of the magazine. And um, he got me there. And from that, that was 1975. And that was a trucking magazine. And I just got into the trucking industry and I just loved the trucking. I loved the people. I loved the products. I loved the contribution trucking makes. 
and it was just a world within a world. And that's how I hooked into trucking, 1975. Uh, I'm not too sure. That's about, what, 45 years ago. And I'm still in this stupid industry. <laughs> but it's, a, I mean, it's an absolutely awesome industry to be in. Robbie, it is. I can't think of any other industry I'd like to be in. It has a, um, you know, I find that truckers very real people. They have their feet on the ground. Many of them that are today, you know, there's huge companies out there, but it all started with one man and one truck, you know, and those companies built up. And I was very privileged now that to meet a lot of those people. And um, they were really courageous people. And still today, I find the trucking industry is fascinating. It's changed tremendously. I feel the entrepreneurial spirit has quite a lot of that has gone. It's now the big corporates, you know, I mean, by the nature of the industry and the natures of the changes, the logistics, the supply chains around the world. Um, so that entrepreneurial sort of lone ranger convoy movie type trucker is, you don't find many of them, but there are a few around, but I, I just love them and I love the truck drivers. They are the unsung heroes of every single economy around the world. I still don't think they get the direct rec uh, or the um, uh, recognition they truly deserve. Um, you've got the most amazing product. Uh, yeah, in South Africa, we're still locked into some old technology. We'll come to that if you want. Um, but in Europe, where you come from, you know, the, the platoons, the autonomous trucks, everything is just mind-boggling now, the way the trucking industry is going. Even the also Musk, who, by the way, is born in South Africa. We're not sure we're going to brag about this at the moment, okay, but we'll do it anyway. <laughs> but it's an amazing, man. Um, he's into electric trucks um, and uh, autonomous trucks and all this type of thing. So those developments are amazing. We're still quite a long way behind there. But then you've got your, your crime. You've got your uh, hijack in South Africa, which is very big, you know, and, and has been. Uh, you've got your uh, cross-border transport and the challenges that bring there's so much to truck in. And the nice thing is, it's not an emotional industry. It's a business industry. You know, you buy a car based on your emotions. I don't think any car dealer has ever sold me a car. You know what car you want before you go into the dealership. You must just fill in the form to make sure there's champagne on the day we collect it. You know? <laughs> um, in trucking, you build up relationships. And I think that, in a nutshell, is what I love about the trucking industry. It's about relationships, not transactions. Yeah. And that is what you build up over the year, relationships. Yeah. And those relationships blossom into friendships. Um, and you must never let the business side get in the way of those, of the friends, or the friendship side get in the way of, of business. If they're messing up, you've got to do it. You've got to tell it like it is. But, but you know, a successful business I want to read is built on relationships, not on transactions. Mm -hmm. And that is what trucking is about. It's sort of relationships, the yeah. people. I mean, Patrick, ever since I've known you, you are very entrepreneurial, you are very visionary, you're a great contributor to the trucking industry in South Africa. You have seen so many different changes, whether it's on technology side, you've seen changes in terms of relationships, and relationships is the stable foundation of the industry. You know, what are some of the key factors or key changes you have seen over the last number of years? Well, the, the, the key changes I, I, I'm seeing in South Africa now um, is the driver is becoming an important component mm -hmm. of the purchase decision. The driver is getting a little bit more recognition. That is a, a key change. The other key change, uh, which is a, a welcome change, the other key change was in South Africa in the old days, the, the, big, the two biggest guys in the town used to be the guy who owned the most trucks and the bank manager. Okay, when they walked down the street, people walked on the other side of pavement and gave them a pavement to themselves. They were the big markets of the town. Okay, it was all about ownership. Now we look at to total ownership costs right over the lifetime of the vehicle. And that takes out the ownership buy for cash. I own so many trucks thing. You now, you've moved into, you've moved into FML. So the whole concept of, of owning and operating trucks, that has been a massive change. Um, the other changes of telematics, of course. Mm. Telematics, the guys used to send out their trucks with the driver and not know where it was till you got to a ticky box and you can make a phone call back before cell phones, okay? <laughs> um, now telematics has made a huge impact in the trucking industry and certainly in South Africa. In South Africa, Robbie, unfortunately, it started um, 
uh, in, oh, it must be 1995-96 after our democratic elections, uh, the business partners came into the country, but so too did a host of crime syndicates, many specializing in truck hijacking. And we saw truck hijacking go through the roof. The guys are losing absolute millions and millions of trucks and loads and everything. And that's where what is today known as telematics, then we used to call it vehicle tracking systems, mm -hmm. uh, because that one it was. Those are introduced in South Africa um, to get your vehicle back, to get your, your, your truck back. And there were many stories I could tell you how successful that was. It wasn't about fleet management, but about recovering your trucks. And it was like gun You know, you could trace your truck to a warehouse, in goes the helicopter, directs the uh, ground forces in and you nab them. And there were big shootouts. It was like, you know, it was like a wild west. Yeah. And um, so that made a huge impact and difference uh, to the long-term industry because from that it developed into fleet management systems. And those today are highly utilized. We've got South Africa, Robbie, was a world leader. I, I'll state this and I'll fight it against anyone. We led the world in telematics. Um, but unfortunately, we led them because of hijacking. <laughs> they then, we were a long time before Volvo had its system, for example. Mercedes Benz had its fleet board. Long time after they launched those systems, South Africa was way ahead of that. And I remember at a Scania uh, uh, press conference at, at the IAA once, the president of the Scania, I forget who it was at the time, was very excited and about 300 journalists. Um, and don't forget, we had just come out of sanctions, so I was like a kid in a candy store. And um, he said, I'm leaving the best till the end. And I, and I was waiting for this, you know, thinking the truck's going to fly or something. And he said, we have got a system that you can see, like you are Robbie in Zurich and I'm in Joburg. You can see Robbie from Johannesburg on your computer. And I thought, we've had that for ages. What are you talking about? That's not you. And unfortunately, being naive and new, and out the sanctions arena into the big wide world, I grabbed the mic and I said, but that's not new. And unfortunately, I blew his whole blinking, you know, best father of comfort head. And I said, send your engineers to us, I'll introduce you to the guys. We're doing that, we've been doing it for ages. You can check your truck anyway. But that developed, so we were building, and if you look at the Hanover show, you'll see companies like Mixed Telematics. Cartrack is now an international company operating in America. So mixed telematics is now listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And that all started in South Africa. There was a mass, probably the biggest change I've seen. And then, of course, after sanctions, Robbie, if we go back, depending on how far back we go, we were locked into one engine because the world sanctioned South Africa, yeah. rightfully so, against the apartheid era. And so we had to become self-reliant. And that is when the ADE, Atlantis Diesel Engines, was formed. And that was a very big success story for South Africa but only for South Africa, but it kept our, our vehicles on the road. We also needed those, those engines for our military vehicles because we were involved in the Golan War then, Southwest, all that sort of stuff. So ADE was a big change. And when that stopped, out of, when, we, when we had our elections, that stopped just before that, in fact. And we were now open to the world to source engines, you know, the original source engine, like our Suzu was the first to move and put their source engine into their truck, do away with ADE. But if I, you know, and, all, and then suddenly we got in Cummins and we got in Detroit and out of those again, we were like kids in a candy store. So there's been so many dynamic and exciting changes that, that we've adopted from Europe and maybe in Europe they haven't seen that, but we, we've had circumstances that have been sort of milestone events in change. But I must say telematics, I've got to stand proud in South Africa, Europe followed us. <laughs> but, but I mean, Patrick, that is so true because I mean, you know, Having lived, grew up and born in South Africa, I totally agree. I think, you know, in a lot of ways, South Africa led the industry and actually not just the automotive, but in many other industries in various aspects, maybe for different reasons. Like you say, you know, telematics really was led because of crime, but that's where it all started. And, you know, South Africans are very entrepreneurial. They do not wait. They don't sit around. They will go and find a plan. They will go and make a plan, a boot mark a plan, and he moves forward. And I think, you know, that spirit has always lived within the South Africans. And we, that's helped drive the industry. You, you, you're absolutely right. It's that resilient nature of South Africans, you know. 
Um, we we were a lone country for a long time, and deservedly so, Rob. I'm not I'm not just. I mean, apartheid was an horrendous system when one looks in hindsight. It was. Uh, it was an horrendous system. So you know, I, I, I remember when when the Swedes left. It wasn't Sweden. It wasn't Scania and Volvo that left. The Swedish government, you know, pulled out all countries. They were the first to go against apartheid via sanctions, and and so now suddenly you're on your own, and you can't just stop. You've got to actually make a plan. Um, and uh, sometimes, as you say, sometimes for the wrong reasons. I mean, in that case, we had a big military machine, and it was a very effective machine. We developed our own vehicle show. We had the most, which is today recognized as probably the world's top test track for trucks in Juratech. Yeah. That was a very, very secure place where they developed military vehicles. Mm -hmm. And then we all had to use the ADE engines in the trucks and in the military. So the reasons are wrong. Okay, we went on our own for wrong reasons. But Fact is, we couldn't just sit. So that's why South Africa, South Africans, and to this day, are still very resilient, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, so we've we've done a lot. Our, our transport companies are operating in Europe. Imperial is is operating, which I didn't know. They're operating blinking barges on the Rhine. I mean, yeah, it's a trucking company. They're operating barges on the Rhine there, and they're doing a lot of logistics for 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 uh, companies overseas in Europe. Uh, Unitrans has got warehouses in Europe. So, you know, that 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 is taken we we Rob, I think when when one looks at the South African trucking industry, I always describe it as a first world and a third world component. Mm -hmm. Not in the traditional sense, okay. Um let me explain it. The first world are the Imperials, the uni transfers, the super groups, and you know, the really top companies. Some even have four or five thousand trucks, some of them have um some more. And then you've got the the third world, which I described as a small to medium sized operation. Now, those are the majority, but some are excellent, some are absolutely shocking. Uh, so we've got that whole mix of components, you know, and it's, uh, it makes it a, a very, and everyone who comes from Europe finds it a very, very interesting market. And by the way, everyone wants to sell trucks here. I don't know why. It's a small market, but everyone, we have the Chinese, we have the Indians, um, Tata, FAW, uh, we have the Europeans, all the major European manufacturers. The ones that have gone are the Americans, funny enough. Freightliner was part of uh, Mercedes Benz over here, uh, Daimler, Daimler Group. They pulled out. Um, I think they needed to upgrade that Freightliner. Our drivers used to call it the Freight Shaker. Okay. And when it got into its counterpart in the Daimler stable, the Actros, it was, the Actros was like some riding on a Japanese fast train, smooth. You don't even know it's me. You get in the Freight Shaker by and you knew you were riding. And the drivers, and I don't need the, I think the real reason, I don't know if the Americans are going to spend the money in upgrading for a small market like us, which is a right-hand drive market as well. We are left there. Uh, we right-hand drive, they left-hand drive. So it's just a guess there. But they are, international is out. So, you know, they're the Americans, but everybody else is here. Everyone else is here. Yeah. No, it's true. I mean, I, think, I agree with South Africa, a mix of first and third world, because you've got leading companies over in Europe, which are really doing logistics for BMW and the likes because they are absolutely incredible. And then you've got the third world, be it the medium and smaller operators, which there are literally hundreds in South Africa. And I know we've discussed this in the past as to why that's been driven that way. And to me, you've got that mix of first and third world. And then you've also got the mix of all the truck manufacturers, parts suppliers coming in from North America, Europe, South America, Asia, China, and it's all coming in together. And to me, I mean, South Africa is really just a melting pot of fascination because of the variety and the culture. It is, isn't it, Rob? And it's always amazed me why everyone, everyone in the world wants to sell their trucks in Africa. I, I've got one or two theories on that. South Africa is a great test center, okay, for the rest of the world. Now, let me give you an example. When the Actros first introduced itself here into South Africa, we introduced it as, well, they, they said it's a new era of, of electronics. We didn't have that. It was all, oh, don't forget the ADE, Atlantis diesel engine connection during sanctions. We lost out on all the new engine technologies there. We were locked into one. And all manufacturers fitted the same engine, eh? Uh, that's another thing. They didn't have choices. They all fitted that. And then, <clears throat> when we went into the electronic era, the Actros brought out its uh, launch, the first Actros here. It bombed out in grand style because they hadn't tested it properly and the conditions were so different to Europe. 
And being electronic, everyone thought perhaps, oh, it's going to work, you know. The computer's going to pick it up. But I mean, you know, computers, you know, and I know. I, thank you, Rob, for teaching me how to get onto this this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I know how to work a span and an old electric. What do you call that? Stuff? Manual type rather. That's how I thought. But <laughs> what? And it blew up tremendously. And Mercedes engineers came out here. And they, they decided, cut along very short. They, they were magnificent in the way behind their customers, by the way. They gave them demo units and loan units and all that while they were trying to fix the problem. And they used East London as a world base for their test centers. Even today, they send their trucks out to South Africa for tests. And one uh, company uh, from Japan said, if it works in South Africa, it works in the rest of the world. We, uh, I think, narrowed it down. I mean, I don't know in the Arctic and all this type of thing, but they test that, you know, that's part of the most manufacturers test, test bed. But South Africa is an amazing, uh, we have incredible gradients. You go from sea level, up to on top of the mountain from Durban to Joburg, and you do that trip twice a day, you know, and, and so it's it's incredible. Our dust content is different. Our weather, you go through four weather conditions in one day, you leave Johannesburg in the sun, you get to uh, Harry Smith in the fog and the rain and the mist, you go down a massive gradient at Port Vernon, then you're back in Durban in the extreme hot sun, and you know, so you they, all those conditions make it a fantastic test bed. And I think someone once said to me, I think it was a guy from Hino who said, if it works in South Africa, if it works in the rest of the world, certainly in the Asian parts of the world. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. Absolutely true. South Africa, definitely the test center for the, the world. If it works there, it works anywhere else. But Patrick, I mean, what are some of the changes that you currently see taking place that shaping the industry in South Africa? I mean, I know right at the beginning we, we discussed and mentioned telematics. You talked about the crime syndicates. But what are some of the impacts that are, you know, disrupting the automotive industry on the trucking side in South Africa today? Okay, I think on a, on a broader front, before we get to the sort of direct one, on the broader front is the political scenario, which has had a tremendous impact on the economy of South Africa. We had a gentleman, a rogue by the name of Jacob Zuma, as our president for nine, nine years, I think it was, my goodness, it seemed like 900 years. He did an amazing job in destroying this country. Um, and you've probably heard the words over there of state capture. I mean, it's got international. Uh, um, we have had people rifling the toll. Money that should have been used in productive growth of the economy went into certain pockets, such as his own. Uh, he has a home in Zuliland called the Pantlo, which was 250 million rand that was taken from taxpayers' funds. He's up on the, at the moment on 730 charges of corruption related to our still. He was in court, by the way. He's going to court. We have a very good legal system. He's going to court, but it keeps on getting postponed. We actually want him in jail, but it keeps on getting kind of postponed. <laughs> okay, he better not do this. He probably will, but anyway. Um, Rob, and he had a horrible effect on the economy and on the psyche of South Africans. Um, we are now dealing with, you know, during his tenure, uh, the uh, international credit rating agencies downgraded our economies to junk status. And so this, as you know, the trucking and GDP grows, so does the trucking industry. If the economy is good, the trucking industry is good. If it's bad, the trucking industry suffers. It's not like, you know, the sale of motor cars, how many were sold last month or last year, tells about consumer confidence. The sale of trucks tells about investor confidence. And so we've seen that decline in truck sales. Uh, on the medium side, certainly. And so we're living with Zuma's legacy. And that has had a huge impact on the economy. You know, it's had a bad, bad impact. So we've got a lot of work to do now. Cyril Ramaphosa came in as ANC president, and we have elections next year. And he is sort of treading a, a sort of middle path from what we can see, you know, treading a, and not wanting to totally alienate ANC, which is the dominant party in South Africa, and ruling party, it's a government. And, um, and, uh, and the new dawn, what he calls. We need a new dawn because we have now a 27% unemployment rate. That we have 17 million people going for welfare checks every month, sure. doing nothing. And um, we have a very low tax base. So all this is not auguring well for the economy. We, we, we're battling in a very tight non-growth economy. Uh, Sir Ramaphosa is trying to clean up the corruption, which is insidious in government circles, not only central government, 
which we've seen, but in peristatals like Eskom, which is the powerhouse of South Africa, provides our electricity. Rob, well, I don't know if you know, but I think it was the year 2000, they switched off the electricity of South Africa. Total, everything. This would, that's, uh, this engine would go nut with nothing. And the whole of South Africa, you look around, everything was switched off. It was amazing. And um, plants just switched off, you know, big production factories uh, lost electricity. So it's in the red. We've lived through that nightmare. And we're hoping it doesn't happen again. But then you had Zuma's friends were called the Guptas, an Indian family that came in here. And they robbed the till in grand style. We also want to see them in yellow uniforms, you know, but they seem to be living the high life in Dubai. Um, and so it's been a torrid time that way. Now we've got to build, as I said earlier, South Africans are resilient, but there's some very big challenges facing our economy. One which um, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa has adopted, and excuse me talking politics, but uh, it has an effect on the economy, which has an effect on trucking. I always say to people, if 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 business didn't wasn't linked to, to politics, then why did they have sanctions? Sanctions was an action implemented by business community to overcome a political system. So at the moment, business is, 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 is sort of, it's in a bad position at the moment because of the politics of the country. And also crime has gone up because of unemployment. Protests are, are all over the country, service delivery protests, and um, guys burning tires. I think I said the other day, we've got to be the, the world's top contributor to global warming at the moment. The man in time, you can't have a practice without burning tires. Um, and so people are frustrated. They've been promised houses for 20 years. They've been promised toilets, right? Basics, water. And they haven't got it, so they're frustrated. And they're protesting every day all over the place, which doesn't make great sense for a, a, an investor. So Cyril Ramaphosa has gone out trying to get $1 trillion dollars of investment and he's actually about halfway there which is amazing um but we've still got a long way to go and uh we're waiting for elections in 2019 i think if he gets in with a solid majority is there he'll be able to make the changes that i think in his heart he needs to make one of the big problems to appease uh other parties such as uh, economic freedom fighters that young julius malema goes out and talks about poverty and up to the poor while he's wearing his Rolex watch um, and his Gucci shoes and all that. Um, to appease all those people, he did say land expropriation without compensation. So they want to take the land from the whites and give it to the blacks because they reckon the whites stole the land from the blacks. Now that is not doing any good for investor confidence, which again impacts on the trucking industry. Those are the bad side. The good side is you always need trucks. The truck manufacturers here are still pumping very well they're launching new products they uh i mean volvo has started its own financial services company yeah mercedes benz is doing good so you'll always need trucks you know and uh so that is a you know we're in, in quite a good position the trucking industry because you can't do without them and i know i'm watching you but rail doesn't function like it used to in the old days so trucks are essential trucks are keeping the wheels of the economy moving so in that sense, the role of trucking in South Africa in that whole potpourri of problems is critical to any kind of survival. And I think some of the politicians are starting to realize that because no politician has ever recognized trucking as an essential. I think that's throughout the world, I don't know. Uh, but, um, you know, the politicians, yeah, certainly I don't think they know a truck even exists, but they are starting to know now. Big challenges, Rob. How prepared are you to navigate the disruptive trends that are set to hit your business? Will you survive and win in the coming years? To understand your level of risk exposure and to help you avoid becoming a statistic of failure, take the free risk assessment here, www.dalcorzogroup.com, which will identify the gaps and how to navigate the risks. By taking the risk assessment, you get a chance to win a free 30-minute strategy session with automotive growth expert Roberto Dal Corso. Roberto can help you identify an amount equivalent to 7% of your total annual sales that you are leaving on the table each year. To survive and win, take action now and visit www.dalcorsogroup.com. No, Patrick. I understand all the challenges, you know, the, the political side of where the companies come from and, you know, what it's meant for the, the trucking industry. But now, in your thoughts, how can the South African government improve that so that trucking can gain and become 
more profitable, become more important, and play its more dominant role in the in the in the whole economy of the country. I think the first thing that the government needs to do is realize that there is a trucking industry. They've always ignored it. And not only the current government, the former government as well. It was a Cinderella. It's always been a Cinderella to the economy. Uh, when I gave an award, uh, Fleetwood gave an award to Nelson Mandela, the late Nelson Mandela, and to F.W. de Klerk. <clears throat> now, they were the guys who negotiated the, let's say, there were a lot of parties, but they negotiated the path to the new democracy. We gave them an award from the trucking industry, as friends of the trucking industry, for creating a climate conducive to growth in which the trucking industry could thrive. Okay, now when I presented this at the Union Buildings to F.W. Clark, who was a former Prime Minister, he said, I wish I'd met you before. I never knew the role of the trucking industry. And I tell my granddaughter when we go to the shop, if we see the ice cream van outside, I say, you see, without the truck, we wouldn't be able to buy your ice cream. He said, I wish I'd known that, because he said he's extended his mind beyond the ice cream into the larger picture of trucking. He said, and in all his years when he was Prime Minister, he didn't realize that. And none of them do. Trucking is always a Cinderella. And I think if they realize the role of trucking, um, like in Ireland, the Trucking Association, apparently, I had a journalist over there who sent me a wonderful story. South African journalist who visited. Um, when, when, you pick, when the Trucking Association phones, I think it's called the Troesh, who is the equivalent of Prime Minister or President, from the trucking industry, phone rings, he picks it up because he realizes the importance of the trucking industry to the country's economy. And Ireland, at one stage, was the bread basket of Europe. 40,000 trucks every, month, every week arriving in Dublin with export. Um, they built a tunnel under the city uh, to, uh, uh, to, to make ease those trucks pop. By the way, part of that tunnel was too low. <laughs> Isn't that lovely, Irish? <laughs> they had to raise it again. I love the Irish. But they give it a recognition. And here we get, they don't have the recognition. Um, they, the, the, the transport minister has a huge portfolio, road, rail, sea, air, freight, passenger, etc., etc. And I mean, I've been in this industry for 45 years. I still learn something new every day, Robbie. Uh, to get one guy like that, to understand the full components of trucking is impossible. We need, I think, he needs his, his uh, portfolio narrowed down. Um, road safety, for example, we are killing fifteen thousand people a year on our roads in our little economy, in our little country. Yeah. It's horrendous, and it's not reducing. We need a minister of road safety, you know, but that's under the transport minister, and he, he's not mm -hmm. impacting. So basically, it's more about politicking than 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 effective efficient action plans that can lead to improvements. That's what I see. I, I think that's what we need. We need to implement action plans on, on joint consensus between the industry and the government yeah. on the way forward. And that's never been, that's never been. Where there's a mild, miles of gap between communication between the government and our own so-called representative association. I'd say so-called because they do a good job and they represent a lot of the big guys from the own advertisers. So a lot of the small guys are left out. That's a road freight association. Yeah. There's not enough communication between the governments and them. And that is a first step, is to actually get to understand each other mm -hmm. and then move forward. And then you can understand each other's problems and restraints and challenges and opportunities. Yeah. But that has not been done. So communication between the government and the industry is absolutely vital and critical to move forward. Because I think the trucking industry as you rightfully mentioned, is the backbone of any economy, especially in South Africa, where you mentioned, you know, braille doesn't work. We don't have any waterways like Germany and Europe. There are no barges. So you really are, it's either rail or it's on the road. And there's a long way to go. Communication, plans, action needs to be put into place. Very much so, Rob. And, you know, as I say, that, that communication gap is, is the Grand Canyon. They don't talk to each other. There was at the RFA conference, the one of the, the big shots from the uh, Treasury Department, they're talking about the introduction of a carbon tax. Now, we can't uh, get, get cleaner fuel because the Department of Energy is not making policy decisions on reducing the sulfur content in our fuel. What needs to be done, the refineries need to be upgraded. Now, some years ago, they, they were looking at 40 billion rand to upgrade that. Now it's up to 90 billion, apparently. The companies won't do that unless they have guarantees of return. 
in other words, you know, there will be proper distribution out there, people will be forced to put it in, etc. Then we can move to Euro 5, Euro 6 engines. Yeah. We are using Euro 5 now, but without the full benefit, but on, not on a wide scale. But the Department of Energy has not made any decisions. So he was there saying how they're going to implement it. And I read the mic afterwards, I said, have you spoken to these people in the room? The only thing they can do at the moment, because of your government's lack of activity on clean and fuel, is to perhaps go towards fuel efficient driving, economical driving skills for their driving, to save fuel that way, proper maintenance of the trucks, make sure it's absolutely spick span maintenance, you know? So your fuel injectors are getting maximum performance is good. They can't do anything about anything else. That's all I can do, because you guys are, but have you spoken to the RFA? And he said, no. And I said, to the RFA, have you spoken to Bob? And they said, no. I said, in the conference, I said, well, can we get a commitment from you two guys to talk to each other? Then we can go forward. And they said, yes. I don't think they've had the meeting. <laughs> so that's where we are. It's very frustrating. So, I, I, so I, I, you know, Robbie, if I may just add something there. The problem with that type of environment is you're in an adversarial relationship rather than a cooperative relation for the good of the country. You're trying to get, you've got your point, you got your, you're not getting together to communicate and work it out. You're rather head bashing. They won't move on this. We've got it on high cube containers at the moment, head bash moving. Um, but no one's getting together to talk. So, so you need to communicate and need to work together. And I, I've never seen it. I'm, in 45 years, I haven't seen that in the government. They, 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 they're all on their own. And that's why I really admire the trucking industry. They, they've been much on their own. They've been much on their own and they, mm. they keep going. And the margins are really low, Rob, so it's not like they're making fortunes. Yeah, yeah. Not anymore. No, they used to buy game farms. Let's talk to them. They're now buying buckies. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I can appreciate, you know, the industry being left alone and communication is a major issue. And I think that's where, you know, the, the Road Freight Association, the government really need to rise up to the challenge, take their leadership position seriously and, you know, start to put it together because by not doing that, you certainly, the country, the whole economy is not maximizing the maximum benefit of the trucking industry. And, and by doing that, I mean, I can imagine that some of the challenges on the freight companies, on the manufacturers, on the distributors, you know, th there are huge challenges. Well, what do you see as some of the challenges in place today? I mean, you mentioned, you know, margins, profit is not anything to be excited about. But what are some I of the think, other challenges? I think that's, well, let's think on that. One of the challenges is how to reduce costs in a growing cost um, uh, cost increase uh, market. Um, that, that, that relates back to uh, one of the things could be governments and, 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 and industry talking. The infrastructure of South Africa, the roads are not good, really. They are, they are putting extra maintenance costs on trucks. Now, our main highways that are in the hands of the concessioners are excellent. They are world class. Durban, Java, you, you, you can compare with anywhere. The N1 going to Cape Town, I love that highway, and it's wonderful. Um, and, and lots of the highways are excellent. They're in the hands of concessionaires. But when you go into the provinces, when you go up the main highway, you're hitting potholes, you're hitting, your tires are going off. Now, that's adding cost all the time. So, again, you know, the money has to be spent in the right areas, which it's not. And roads maintenance really needs to go uh, high priority now because it's adding cost to the transport industry, and we, we can't have that cost added. We need to be globally competitive, and we can't have that extra cost. So, we, so in a very high cost climate, we are uh, the transport operators are battling. Um, fuel has, it just keeps going up and up and up. Now, we are out of the hands. Out of, that's A lot of that's out of our control, the RAND dollar and the international oil prices, out of our hands. But there's a massive fuel tax in South Africa, mm -hmm. some of which is to make up the shortfall and this is, this is true, to make up the shortfall generated during Zuma's era of thieving. You know, it's like you've got, um, VAT is up by 1%. So it was 14%, it's 15%. You've got fuel every month it's up, but there's a big tax component. 53 cents was added earlier this year. One for the road accident fund, which compensates third party victims in, in uh, road accidents. We should actually be spending our time on reducing accidents. You know, and I'm saying that's what you should be doing. But it's it's billions and billions of rands going into that. And they are in the red, by the way. They, they, they're not doing well. 
they can't keep up. And then the other goes into the the, the general fuel levy. Where that goes from, no one knows. It's not ring fenced or anything. So a lot more has to go. There's not a road maintenance fund, you know. So that has to go in there. Uh, your maintenance costs on a good road done by Imperial uh, go up 123% from a good road to a bad road on an interlink. 123%. That's the type of cost increase you're talking about. So I'm really talking big. You know, you put that across the entire industry. That's big stuff. You're bursting tires. You're popping airbags. It's that bad, some of those roads. And then, um, yeah, so how do you contain the costs? Uh, you can... Uh, driver training is one way of really every trucking operator can reduce cost tremendously. Yeah. But uh, training used to be a culture in South Africa. It's actually not anymore. It's not anymore. We used to have, um, like the Lake Slay driver training school for truck drivers. It's no longer. So the big companies are training, uh, the manufacturers are training on their own brands. But where does a youngster go get training? Hard to find someone like that. Um, so we need to, we need to push that up. Driver training related to accidents is another challenge. That's why we need trained drivers. We're having too many accidents on the road. We've got a horrendous death rate on the road, Rob. Yes. So, two words, the challenge is, I can do you a list there. <laughs> it's, it's really big, which makes exciting. Uh, Rob, we, the other day, on Friday, exam, uh, Fleet Trotch, along with our partners, GRW. GRW, by the way, is a big tanker manufacturer, trailer manufacturer, you probably know that. Uh, the largest trade of uh, manufacturer in Europe has bought 33% of that South African company. So in the Hanover show, who those who might be there, go to Cargo Schmidt Cargo Bull. And um, is always a Cargo Schmidt's Bull. Schmidt Cargo Bull, yeah. Schmidt's um, Cargo Bull. New to us, new to us in South Africa, but very welcome to South Africa. There's a tremendous transfer of knowledge and experience and technologies between these two companies. Uh, because GRW is the great, biggest trader manufacturer and really quality stuff. They're in Europe, they're in UK already, but now with Cargo Schmidt, Schmidt Cargo Bull, they're, they're going to have the first South African tanker on the Hanover show in September will be displayed. Yeah, exactly. That's the first South African. Then we've got car track on this project. Uh, we have got uh, Holland Insurance. Um, we've got Shell. Now, what we're trying to do with all this, we've got a company called Nose the Logistics, which is driving training because we want to push it. Um, mm -hmm. We have turned the truck into a gym, Rob. Okay, truck drivers cannot go at the end of the day, like you and I do, go to Virgin Active or go to our local gym. I oh, know, I missed you there at four o'clock this morning. <laughs> I wish I'd been there. <laughs> Where did they go? They're waiting at border posts. Another problem, big delays at our border posts. Up to 13 days, Rob, the guys sit at border posts. You know, where's the transport efficiency? Where's the global competitiveness? Big inefficiencies at border posts. And so, they sit in there, they do nothing. They can't go to the gym. We went to the Biokinetics Department of Stellenbosch University and they devised, uh, they put on a full team. And I said, I want you to turn the truck into a gym where the guy is carrying his gym with him all. So they devised over 60 exercises. And bro, we launched that on Friday. So the truck, we want the truck driver to be healthier. And so he's carrying his gym with him now. We've done a booklet, we're getting an, an app is online, everything. And we're going to try and make the, uh, the truck driver uh, healthier and fitter in his own interest, in the interest of his family, and in the interest of the industry. And there's a huge amount of buying already just from Friday. It's actually wonderful to see. I mean, Mike, that is such a fantastic initiative. But, you know, just going back a second, I mean, it certainly sounds like uh, the industry needs a lot of investment, whether it's on the road side, whether it's on the education side, the training side, you know. And I mean, some of the entrepreneurial things that I absolutely love about Fleetwatch is, you know, exactly what you've gone and said, you know, taking a gym to the truck driver. So it's not so much about investment and resources, but it's more about being resourceful in, in your way. And something else, you know, which I love that initiative, I want to touch on later on, is your Breakwatch initiative that you do. Because yes. that is something I think you're also very passionate about and contributing to the industry. Yes. Look, again, you know, you can't just sit and wait. Hey? Um, so we see a massive accident rates on the road and many operators, because of the low margins, are not maintaining their trucks. But on the other hand, the cops are not trained out on the road to identify unroadworthy signs on trucks. They, they don't get their training. Um, so one could sit and you could knock government, you could knock this, could knock it, or, or want to do something about it. So we decided to do something about it. 
And so we did, uh, we do an exercise called break and tire watch. Now, again, we always get partners in because I promise Rob, I learn something new every day. I'm not clever enough to do all this stuff. This is clever guy. I just come up with ideas and we go forward. And I, I look like I'm very, might be knowledgeable, but I pick everybody's brains for it. And I come out looking okay, but it's their knowledge. <laughs> um, no, I have BBW Axles, well known in your part of the world. Um, Webco, well known throughout the world. Uh, Bridgestone, um, even the bank is with us, Standard Bank. And we've now got an, uh, another insurance company with us. And so, and Mixed Telematics, uh, 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 Telematics company, which is operating in Europe, America, I mentioned it earlier on, used to be Matrix, listed on New York Stock Exchange, we're really proud of that, and on Dover Stock Exchange. <laughs> and, um, and they are our partners. Now, we, we four times a year, we get the traffic officers together. We get about 80 of them in a room. It's a two-day training exercise. We talk to them about the importance of brake components, how they work, how braking works, how tires work, et cetera, et cetera. How to read the outer lining. The second day is a practical day where we go to a test center and we literally randomly take off trucks off the road. We just pick them off and we put them on the brake rider tester. We show them around. The cops are divided into teams, each one with an expert. And we show them things like a slack adjuster. None of them, many of them, majority of them haven't been on a truck before. We show them how a slack adjuster. We show them a brake booster because when you stop, you say, okay, guys, how do you test the brakes on an interlink when you stop? He says, now you go behind, you tell the guy to put the foot on the brake. And, and, and then the lights come on. And he said, okay, they're telling you the electrics, the brake work on air. It doesn't have anything to do with it. So you're sending off a guy with his electrics working, but his brakes on good utopia. And we train them like this. And the, the, the enthusiasm and the passion of these cops when they get that training and they get a little bit of leadership, a little bit of dignity back, is a it's, it's just one of the most amazing things. And obviously, not all of them are interested, you know. Um, and but but you get a call that is just comes out top cops from. Now the, the unfortunate thing, and this is going to shock everyone listening here. Now, the past ten years we've been doing this four times a year. Is we've tested about seven hundred and call it seven hundred and thirty trucks. We still failed sixty eight percent of. Them. Wow, sixty eight. That's about four hundred and twenty or something. I've got the figures somewhere, but. Uh, truck we fail. Now those failures rate from no brakes to ABS not working to having wrong slack adjusters, etc. Uh, but all faulty that need discontinuations. And that's not the ones that get fines for certain descriptions. They can carry on on the road. And we take them off the road. It's a real life exercise. The one night in Midway, which is Midway between Durban and Johannesburg, um, uh, one of our main economic routes, uh, Gauteng, which is where Johannesburg is, is our economic hub. Durban is our main harbour, export harbour. So it's a massive route. One night at about two o'clock in the morning, we did a night exercise. I said to the cops, whoa, stop, bring no more trucks in. They said, wow, I said, we've got no more parking space. It's full, full, bad, internet's parking. The next day there were service crews changing tires, changing this, changing that. So that's a bad news. But again, the good news is that we're getting a core of cops that are now trained. And we're getting awareness among operators because they don't want to be calling one of those exercises because we, we we give it a lot of publicity as well, you know. Um, and and they and the thing is not to be a, a policeman, not to hammer them, but to show them this folly of not maintaining their trucks. Yeah. Because that adds to the cost, etc. As we go back to our previous thing, and all adds to the cost and makes you uncompetitive. Um, but so that's what we do on the cop side, and there's a lot of other things to do. Drop, call me crazy, <laughs> but. Uh, we like to make a difference, you know. Um, uh, it's not, you know, I find many companies today are into the bottom line, which is very important. And my bottom line has suffered tremendously over the past year since these wonderful banks imploded the world in 2009. Remember those greedy buggers? Eh? Yeah. I think Iceland jailed them, the right thing to do. Um, the rest of them got bonuses. I wrote an article at the time that I should have been a banker. You know, you can mess up the world and get a bonus for it. Um, they messed up the economy of South Africa horrendously. Over a million people were retrenched that year. Companies fell, trucking industries went down. Uh, truck sales dropped 50%. All because of some bankers over there, the one who said you've got to keep dancing while the music sings. Well, he switched off the music for millions of people around the world. And I hope he got no radio today to even to listen to Frank, Frank Sinatra singing, I did it my way. Because when he did it, he made it up the world and caused heartache for millions of people. And they still talk about it, probably. 
they still talk about, probably in Europe as well, they still talk about the great, the global financial crisis. What was global financial crisis? The global financial greedy, stupid bankers, that's what it was. And it destroyed the world. And so, you know, we've all suffered because of that. It changed the world. And um, yeah, so let's hope they don't do it again. But they do it. You know, remember, Barclays did the uh, lie about the LIBOR rates after that. So, you know, there's so many outside impacts in trucking also that, that are out of your control. Um, and it's nice to get back in a world that is just taken. That's what I, I went to the bank, I went to the subject of banks, I feel strongly about it. Um, uh, and, and they're just taking, there's so much greed in the world. I worry about Trump, you know, let's make America great because it's just looking at us. Let's make us great. Certainly there are something, but I think he's going to take over more. He's certainly alienating the European Union. That is having an effect on global trade. It's coming into South Africa. Our own trade and industries minister, Rob Davies, says now, then they're going to uh, ban the import of chicken from, from America. We import a lot of chicken because we have been impacted by the aluminium ban going into America, along with your European Union uh, uh, countries. So it's even impacted yet. Now, chicken transport in South Africa is huge. Unitrans, so you see where it all comes back to the trap. Unitrans holds massive amounts of chickens for Rainbow. One of the biggest refrigerated reaper operators in South Africa is called Hestony on trucking. Carrying majority is carrying chickens. Okay, so uh, a good import with the doors open, he'll be carried, but now that door's going to be shut, he's going to be affected. And so a lot of things are just take today. Let's take. I think the world should start giving a little bit back. And, and, and you're going to benefit by giving anyway. You're going to get it. Maybe the profit margin isn't that high. Maybe you're going to go through really tough time, but benefit a little. Don't go overboard on the state just for me. And that's what we try, uh, Rob. We want to make the world a better place. It sounds soppy, hey? But hell, it's a great legacy for my kids, you know, if we can make it a better place for them. I think we need more people, more people exactly like you that want to give back. I mean, if there are people out there that are watching this and want to get involved and want to help you, create new ideas and help give back to the industry in South Africa. Can they get a hold of you directly? What's the best way to, to get involved in those sort of initiatives with you? Ravi, yeah, that's a wonderful invitation and, uh, and I open my email to everyone. Can I give you my email address? Absolutely. I will also stick it up on the link you, for everyone. Okay, it's fleetwatch at pixie, P -I -X -I -E, dot C -O dot Z -O. Comes into my personal computer, the one I'm talking to you now, and <laughs> so I will get it and I will respond to every single one. And we welcome ideas because you know, 2,000 heads are better than one. Let me tell you, Rob, where and I encourage everybody who, who might have a little idea and might be too scared to go ahead with it. Um, we've got big health issues throughout the world, but in the trucking industry, one of the big health issues was HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. And I went to Zambia in 1994. And I spoke to an operator there and he said, Patrick, I go through 100% driver turnover every two years. And I said, well, that's bad management or very mobile market, a great market. You chop, you know, for a rand an hour or whatever. He said, no, no, I have a sickness. And I said, what, a malaria? Because malaria is big in Africa. Yeah. And uh, he said, no, AIDS, HIV. And I said, oh, I've heard of this HIV. It was 1994. No one was talking about it. Not us, no and I came back to South Africa and I did an investigation. I've got the World Health Organization and I found AIDS was following the truck routes coming down north, coming into us. And there was a disaster in our way. I went to government, nobody wanted to do it. I then decided we are going to do it. I walked out of a meeting with 40 people who said, okay, next meeting is in three months. I said, no, no, no. Three months, lots of people are there. We need to act now. We haven't got time to talk anymore. And as I walked out, I said, I'm sorry, with due respect, I'm not going to, I'm going to go do something to my own. We, we can't wait. Our trucking industry can hit. Because you've got ladies of the night, commercial sex workers. I love that title for, for, for ladies of the night. And I love them. They're wonderful people. I've met a lot of them. They're making a living. Different, different way, but they make a living. But um, uh, this lady walked out and she handed me a card. And she was head of UNAIDS. And her and I worked together on some good projects and we got it going. And eventually I challenged the uh, transport minister to do something. He took up the challenge. He found me on a Tuesday, one Tuesday, I challenged him on a Friday. And we got the role players together. And I cut a long story short, Rob. That's where trucking against AIDS started. 
everyone, we were the laughing stock. The transporters were saying, it's not our problem. It's the Department of Health. And I said to the transporters, so what are you going to do? Are you coming? He said, no, we just take them off the pavements like they used to. I said, one day those pavements are going to be empty because people are going to be dead from AIDS. Mm. If we don't do something about it, it's going to, and those that are there, you will find the HIV positive if we don't do something about it. Yeah. And um, that was the attitude, understandably, there was so much ignorance about it. it none. And the first guy we went to go see with AIDS was in Barragana's hospital. One of my journalists, excuse me, went, and he was half an hour too late. The guy had died half an hour before. So our first contact was there. And I said, no, this is crazy. We put trucking against AIDS, developed into trucking wellness, which was with us on Friday. They have another one of our partners in Diving Earth. And I know there are 21 clinics at truck stops around South Africa. There are 11 mobile clinics. There's printed donated by like the city's vents and that, that visit depots. Over 700,000 people have been through those clinics, right? Today they treat them for everything, not just testing our HIV. So you can go there, have your blood pressure. When you're in South Africa, you come with me, we're going to get your blood pressure checked. Okay. <laughs> so one small step when you're fighting uh, ridicule, when you're fighting people who say, no, we don't care, but keep to that, that commitment that you have and that conviction you have, and you can go for it. We passed it on. It's now under the National Bargaining Council, totally accepted by the industry. And um, it's, it's absolutely stunning to watch those results. So, so fight through the walls, you know, don't let a wall put up in front of you. And I just say that as encouragement to many people out there who think, gee whiz, I, I can't get much, you know, um, because there's a lot of, you know, we, we, when we're talking companies, what have we been bombarded by, Rob? Sorry, I'm going on a bit, but we've been bombarded by Facebook, and you see, you know, it lost 20 billion or whatever it is, but it's still making 120 billion. I mean, I can't even think of that, you know, really. And you, and you know, Snapchat, and this, they're all making or losing billions of rands. Yeah. We're starting to feel terribly insignificant, but you're not. Because I want to remind everyone, Facebook was started by two guys. One guy was Zuckerberg. I haven't a clue who the other one was. But the Zuckerberg is still out there. was started by one guy. You, whoever you are out there, can start your idea of one person, and you can take it to not to make money. Money will follow if it's going to, but... Mark Zuckerberg didn't start that to make money. He started, he didn't, he's got a monster, he didn't, never knew he was going to create. He, he didn't, uh, I mean, he didn't, on his own admittance, he did it to get people to understand each other, I think was his thing. It's a monster that he didn't know he was great. He's faced Senate committee meetings, etc. But one guy started that. That's where I, he had my great admiration. I'm, I, I don't have a huge amount of admiration for Facebook at the moment, but he, as an entrepreneur, stunned Elton Musk, making a few mistakes now, but look what he's done. You know, one person, but 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 start with wanting to give. And so, please, if anyone wants to give on the trucking industry, feel free to contact. And 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 I pretty we make some bucks as well. You know, they they said one day they're going to put on my grave, I the only principle that broke. It's probably going to come true. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Pat, you can, I mean, that's why I find you so inspirational because you know you, you know, in South Africa. You have really led from the front. You have taken some very simple, very important issues and started to be resourceful and move the industry in that direction in making a change, making a difference. So to you, to me, you're always very inspirational. You are a true entrepreneur of the industry and a voice of the industry. So, you know, from my side, I can only say thank you. Don't stop. Just keep going. Bobby, thank you so much for those kind words. And, you know, there's a lot of people who just need a, a little nudge and then they buy in. And so the fruition of all those projects comes from a lot of input from people. But, uh, uh, yeah, I, I really thank you for uh, those kind words. It uh, touches my heart. Touches no, no, no. You, you keep going. I mean, you know, you know, just to kind of sum up a little bit of the South African industry then, I mean, the backbone of the industry facing a multiple of challenges, you know, and starting from political to crime, and, you know, we could go on the crime and talk all week. But, I mean, there's so many challenges, but yet there are so many opportunities, and all it takes is more people to just stand up and want to make a difference. You know, and it starts off with clear communication, it starts off with leadership, and, you know, put a plan together and execute and deliver on it. That's it. That's it. Yeah. I, I, I go to so many conferences, Rob. 
I've stopped going to them now because I hear a lot of talk and no implementation. Mm. And some of that talk is really sensible in terms of it, but it never results in implementation. We need implementation in the world, and, and that's, what, that's, what, that's what we go for. So I've stopped going to all these talk shops. There's so many of them, and they talk wonderful ideas, but then they, they all disappear. And I don't know where they go to because the plans don't get implemented, and there's, there's really good stuff that can be done. So there's lots of opportunity, as you say, lots of challenges, combined with lots of opportunity, makes for an exciting life. No, it does. And I mean, touching on that, that's why seven out of ten change initiatives fail. You know, there's no act, you know, there's not the right actions or limited actions behind it and nothing takes place. And hence things land up failing. But just to change gears a little bit, I mean, what are some of your passions and interests outside of the automotive industry? Outside of my, my family, my family is my first passion. I have wonderful kids. Um, they got through the teenage years, <laughs> but thank goodness without drugs and all that. And um, as a, a bit of a disciplinarian, you know, I said to them, if they want to go to clubs, they can go. I said, you know, trust brings freedom. And so if I can trust you, you can go anywhere. But if I can't trust you to do things, you can't. So let's go to the clubs and I'll be there with you. I'll go to the clubs and you're not going to like having an old bugger like me sitting in the corner watching you had right now. <laughs> so. Anyway, no, but they, they've grown one. My family is lovely, uh, and my extended family as well. Um, you know, relatives and all that, that's great. And then the relationships I've built out of the army have never, ever stopped. You know, we, we went through tough times in those times. We still, some of us old buggers, if you looked at us when you walked into the restaurant where we meet, which was around when we were all teenagers, it's still there. It's a steakhouse called the Thunder Gun, and we meet there. You walk in and you think, now that's a deaf and dumb old age society. But you know, those are some of the best street fighters in town in their day. <laughs> we still get together um, from school and our army, my army guys, we still get together once a month um, in the evening. So, you know, my passions are, are friendships. Uh, my family first, my friendships. And um, yeah, and never to forget old friends, you know, and, um, and of course my, my, my huge passion is the trucking industry and those people inside it, you know, they, a lot of them have become friends. I mean, yesterday I went to the rugby, that's why we couldn't do this, invited by me, you know, by their box at, um, uh, we watched the Lions beat the Warriors, by the way, they're in the final in New Zealand, New Zealand, you're going to get your backside skip next Saturday, the Lions are coming over, and in there I met new people from the industry, you know while we were there and we are going to be in contact with each other and you know it just grows and grows that friendship circle that relationships and and bro, my passion is, is is learning you know about this industry my other passion is writing i love writing i love being a journalist i love writing i don't get enough time to do good writing you know that, that journalism always got deadlines so you got to move it um but i love writing and um and my other passion is golf um, my son got a scholarship to America. Oh, wow. And he was there for five years. He's unfortunately had an operation on his hand now, which has put him out, but, but his dream is to be a professional golfer. My younger daughter is at uh, uh, Selimosh studying politics, economics, and philosophy. I said, leave the politics out there, bunch of all these other things. <laughs> um, so, golf. And uh, friendships, of course, friendships is, yeah, that's it. It's quite simple. I play guitar every now and again. I used to sing for my supper when I was a student. I was at university. I forgot to tell you, I went to university um, for eight months. And they said, you've got to write exams. I said, you didn't tell me that when I joined. Um, <laughs> because you know, I was on the rag committee. I was, and, I, and we had a great party. I played soccer for bits. Um, and I used to go to this one uh, hotel and uh, lounge. And I'd play guitar, folk songs, old Bob Dylan and all that, and they'd give me a plate of food for play. It wasn't a big plate, so I couldn't have been very good. <laughs> it wasn't like a mean steak, you know, it's like a little bit, you know. So I couldn't have been very really good. <laughs> they gave me a bit of food, but um, so I still love music. But uh, yeah, passion is life. Passion is life. No, and then you, you can see it. You breathe it out of every pore in your body. And to me, when are you bringing out a book then? Sorry, Rob, that one? When are you going to be writing a book? Oh, Rob, you know, I tried a novel. <laughs> I, I, I was also a game ranger at one stage, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I tried a novel and I wrote the first two pages 
And I gave it to my wife to have a look. And she's an avid reader. She goes to three, four books a week. Uh, not me. And um, I, I gave it to her to read. And she said, yeah, it's nice. And I said, what kind of word is that? Nice means nothing. My, it must either be great or it must be absolute rubbish. What is nice? Nice means it's nothing. It's nowhere. And I took it out and tore it up. And then I went and I'm the printed thing. I said, no, that's rubbish. With my start on my great novel, my best city, Charlize to run in the movie, okay? <laughs> and she says to me, it's nice. Now, nice is not a word. Nice is insipid. Nice is terrible. <laughs> and if she had said to me, it's horrible, that would have been better. If she said to me, it's great, it would have, I would have got it. So I took it up. I came and I read it back on the same computer where your face is right now. And I, after I read it, I thought, this isn't even nice. This is rubbish. Well, <laughs> and I pushed the delete button. So oh, right, no. I've got so much in my head that are people like yourself, people, you know, and, and experiences of people. Mm -hmm. And I've got to maybe um, stop being so busy to get some time to write it. Uh, yeah. Because I've got a lot of a lot of themes in my head. And Charlize Theron, okay, she's going to star in my first novel. She doesn't know it yet, okay? She doesn't know me, but I want to. She grew up in Boxford, okay? She knows how to write. <laughs> so well, I'm hoping one day to do a book, yeah. I've got a lot of experiences of uh, people, many around people, you know, all my experiences about people. Um, I'm sure people I, would I remember, say events. I don't remember events, I remember the people in the events. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm sure if people want to hear about all your experiences, you, you've got a lot to give back. Yeah, no, and, yeah. Mm, thank you, Rob. Thanks for that, so, no. And Patrick, I'm I'm conscious of your time and I'm conscious of Sunday and I don't want to steal more of your family time. If you had some final words for the automotive industry, for anyone out there listening and thinking about, you know, maybe coming to South Africa, doing something in South Africa, what what words of advice would you have for them? Do your homework. Do your homework first before coming into South Africa. Uh, use people like yourself ex-South Africans, you are very real about the situation, you consult on that, Robbie. Um, because there's guys like Mike Schussler, the environment has changed. Um, uh, guys like Mike Schussler, who's a wonderful economist, independent, not linked to a bank or anything. He's getting a lot of inquiries now, no longer about South Africa, but about Angola and about Zambia and all that, which I think is, is, is unfortunate, and he thinks is unfortunate, because there's still tremendous opportunities in South Africa. But it's not like just come in and you're going to wipe, you know, take over the world from South Africa. You're going to take out. We're not a backward, you know, and I'm talking in trucking. It's not a backward industry. A lot of people come in and think, wow, we're going to, you know, we can offer that. And they, they, their eyes are open. They can learn so much from South Africa. Do your homework yeah. uh, before coming in. And uh, But everyone is welcome. There's still great opportunities in South Africa. Um, great challenges, but great opportunities. But, my advice is don't think of South Africa as a little backward African country. It's not. Um, GRW faced that challenge when they went with their trailer products into Europe. Most people thought they were a little backward. But if, when they came over and they saw the plant that they had, the manufacturing plant, the techniques that they're using, the world-class quality standards that they're adhering to, they changed their mind. So South Africa, it's not a, a backward little yucky, yucky place that you come in. We, we don't, we cook out of pots, but they're on gas stoves now. Okay, not on fires anymore. <laughs> um, and uh, there's no lines in the streets, okay? <laughs> um, so uh, come out, it's a sophisticated market on the one side. We have an informal sector on the other side. It's a high level of poverty. There's, a, there's very rich people here, there's very poor people. It's, it's such a mix of challenge and all that. And there's um, uh, some shocking politics. There's some good politics. There's, oh, Rob, D.R.M.O.K. D.R.M.O.K. But as I said, I'm repeating myself. It's not a little back African country with lions in the streets and donkey coats running around on the highways. It's a very sophisticated market in the trucking industry. Very sophisticated. Otherwise, people like Scania, Volvo, um, Mercedes-Benz, and and that and, and, and all those people wouldn't be here. They wouldn't be. No, no, thank you. Thank you so much for those kind words. How prepared are you to navigate the disruptive trends that are set to hit your business? Will you survive and win in the coming years? 
To understand your level of risk exposure and to help you avoid becoming a statistic of failure, take the free risk assessment here, www.dalcorzogroup.com, which will identify the gaps and how to navigate the risks. By taking the risk assessment, you get a chance to win a free 30-minute strategy session with automotive growth expert Roberto Dal Corso. Roberto can help you identify an amount equivalent to 7% of your total annual sales that you are leaving on the table each year. To survive and win, take action now and visit www.dalcorsogroup.com. Patrick, are we going to see you at Automechanica or IAA later this year in Europe? I had an invite coming up this past week um, to be at the IAA, so I'm looking forward to being there. I love the IAA show. It, uh, it gives you a, a great handle on what's, what's happening in Europe, and a lot of what happens in Europe does come into South Africa, you know, so you can, and a lot of what happens in Europe is totally unsuitable to, to South Africa, so it won't come into South Africa. But it gives you such a handle, it's, it's the most amazing show, it gives you such a handle on where the trucking industry is. And you can almost predict every every show what what the themes are going to be on the different. That was Euro Euro three at one stage, and then and I would say this one is probably going to be like uh, and I don't know. Okay, I'm going to be interested. It's probably going to be autonomous trucks or something like that. You know, I think that's going to be the the theme throughout. Safety and autonomous trucks is going to be because Euro six is there and all that, and it's a general theme. So you can see where we're going. By the way. We had uh, Volvo, for example, um, I've mentioned them a few times, but they're quite good. And, and Mercedes has just introduced a new actress with uh, enhanced safety features, active brake assist. So we're getting all those things in the country. Um, one transport, a car transport, has all the features uh, incorporated by Volvo. And you know, Rob, very interesting. This is where I'm, I'm going to be looking quite closely at the IA. When the actress was launched a couple of weeks back, the new actress that was launched in Europe in uh, some time ago, um, we now have a chair. I said to them, the global marketing manager of Daimler Group was there, and in the press conference, I said, it must be coming more difficult for you guys to differentiate your product because there's no bad trucks out there, you know, out of Europe. There's very few bad trucks out there. Um, and so, how do you differentiate your product? It's around about the services around the trucks and all that. But he said something very interesting. He said, Patrick, you're absolutely right. It is becoming more difficult to differentiate. Because if you think of it, there's seven brands and four companies left in Europe. Yeah. That's quite amazing. Seven, I didn't, uh, you know, Foxy, Scania together and all that. So seven brands and four companies. And I said, you're going back to sanctions, which we had. During sanctions, we had seven brands and seven manufacturers in South Africa. You got them in Europe now. So it should be interesting to see how the, the vehicle is going to differ, how the manufacturers can differentiate themselves now. Because the product is good. And they're pretty much all the same. They won't, obviously, you get some differences, and they won't agree with me on that, but we're outside pretty much all the same. But it's around the truck that the services are not coming in. That should yes. be interesting to keep an eye on. Yeah. No, no, I, I fully agree. I mean, I, I'm hoping to catch up with you at IAA, but yes. I mean, I would expect the same thing because today it's not so much about the product or the truck, but it's really about the added services, integration, yeah. connectivity that all connects up to. Because, yes, in Europe, we're definitely going down the road of autonomous driving, electric vehicles. That's, you know, it's no more up for debate. That will happen. It's a matter of when. But the in between phases is really going to be, you know, a truck becoming more connected to the person or the driver and the organization. So taking telematics to a whole new level. Yes. I'm looking forward to autonomous driving. I can't wait for my car to wake up on a Sunday morning and take itself for a wash. That's yeah. going to be bliss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I went in an autonomous golfer to help me on the golf course. <laughs> 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 hey, I can only say thank you so much. It's been an absolute blast and pleasure. I I thoroughly enjoyed having a chat with you. Oh, uh, it's such a pleasure chatting to you as well, Robbie. It's, it's lovely, eh? You know, the way that uh, we took an interconnected truck, and yeah, we are. How many miles away are you? 10,000 miles? I don't know. 
Well, at, uh, least, at least five and a half thousand miles. So yeah, probably 10, eight, 10,000 kilometers, I guess. Yeah, and we're talking to each other live. I mean, I mean isn't it? It's quite scary. Rob, the first time I, I recognized the power of um, this new technology, I was in Chicago with the International, funny enough. Yeah. And I had a, to finish a story. I don't write well on a plane. And um, air hostess has picked me off all the time. They look so gorgeous sometimes. But uh, no, no, come, fine. And I know uh, writing on planes, I don't do it very well. So as soon as I got into the hotel in Chicago, I had an article I had to finish on. And remember, it was a thousand words, so many years ago. And um, the layout was done. I had a thousand words to pop into the word space. Uh, and so when I got into the hotel room, I sat down and I didn't even shower anything. I opened my laptop and I thought, finish this before you stop, because otherwise you're not going to get it done. Now, Joe is a fantastic procrastinator. Wait till the last minute. <laughs> and I finished my time work, and I had that big modem that goes in the, bottom, the side of a computer with a big chunky Nokia or whatever it was. And I had learned how to email it just before I went, because that was the first time I was going to do that. And I emailed this, and boom, off it went into the ether somewhere. And a thousand words landed in Honeydew in Johannesburg instantly or almost instantly. I got up, I closed the computer and I walked to, the, uh, to my uh, case, which was on the bench, open up, gave a shine, and I stopped in the middle and I looked back at that cell phone and the computer. And I thought, that was amazing. That is amazing. That a thousand words has gone with no landline, no connection, just from a cell phone to a computer to a funny little card like a credit card up there and a thousand words have landed 10,000 miles away. That is it. I thought, how does it work? I thought, no, 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 no. I'm not clever enough to ever know how to do it. But when I push that button, that is awesome. And that's when I first realized the power of this. And look at the how it's gone now. You and I are talking to each other. I don't think that was there then. No, 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 no. no. And I mean, you know, you, you mentioned it. I mean, and you can just see that sort of thing, how it takes place. And it's transforming the industry just on... You know, digitalization in terms of electronics, parts, catalogs, information, yeah, service manuals, yeah. you know, and that's the good side. The, the bad side for some of the distributors, I guess, out there is also price transparency because of digitalization. So, I mean, it's, it's impacting in all multiple directions at the same time. It is. Look, you know, so now just, just sort of, um, the other change to our industry is digital, of course, you know, the mm -hmm. publishing industry. It's had a huge impact on, yeah. on digital. You know, we used to be print all the time, a uh, successful print magazine once a month, and that was it, you know, and then booklets and that. Mm -hmm. uh, we do a lot of educational books as well, by the way, like trailer maintenance. You know, right now, funny enough, just, and it's a trailer guy, that one there. That's, uh, those are our educational books, you know, as well. So it's not just a magazine and a new. Um, and it's had such an impact on the publishing industry, you know, right throughout the world. You've seen it over there, um, and that's that's been been a huge impact on our on our sector. And that same impact, what do they call it? Disruptive technologies. Yeah. Uh, you've got to embrace them, or you've got to change, and all that. So those are big challenges, I think, for every sector of society, yeah? not just trucking, for every sector of society. This has been actually talking to you on the screen, you know, ten thousand miles away, which was never before. I mean, everything. It's incredible. It's amazing. But we mustn't let it control us, eh? We've got to control it. <laughs> There's a time and a place for everything. And we've got to, as you say, keep it in its box and utilize it to the best, but don't yeah. let it get out of control. Yeah, yeah. They have total admiration for the people who've invented all this, but, but you're not going to control me, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Patrick, you know, I can only say thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for giving up your family life a bit and sharing with us, sharing us your experiences, sharing, you know, the automotive industry, some of your, some of your knowledge, because you are a mindful of knowledge. Uh, thank you, Ravi. And what a pleasure to be talking to you as well. Rich. I hope that you have enjoyed and found value in watching this interview. If you want to learn more about the leading disruptive automotive trends impacting the industry, check out www.dalcorsogroup.com. I encourage you to share it with colleagues that will appreciate great industry insights. Join us tomorrow for more experts from around the world.